Now touch your neighbor, take neighbor, we gonna go deep right now. <laughs> for there is a textual problem here, Bobby, that has been debated for centuries. And you find that many translations of the Bible have the words spoken by Jesus in red. Do you have one of the Bibles? However, there has been some discussion. Watch this. There has been some discussion as to whether or not these are the actual words of Jesus. See, according to biblical criticism, these words are not found in the earliest manuscripts of Scripture, but were apparently added at a later time for liturgical purposes or for the purpose of worship. In fact, in some translations, you'll find that this doxology is not found in the main text, but are either in parentheses or in a note at the bottom of the page. In fact, Luke's version of this prayer makes no mention of these words. And so it has been suggested that the source of these words may be found in 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verse 11, that says, Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. And this, cor and this corresponds to the doxology used in temple services. Now, having said this, regardless of what theological criticism may suggest, I believe we must still consider these words as a part of the actual biblical text. For I believe what Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 16, that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. So listen again to these words. You know them. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I just want to see if y'all are awake. <laughs> now this doxology is significant because what it does is bind all the petitions of the prayer together into one perfect prayer. These words are an offering to God, to the God who hears and answers prayer. Mm, I just said something there. There ought to be about 50 folk in here who knows that God hears your prayer. <laughs> that he will answer your prayer. In the words of this doxology, Jesus teaches us that prayer is always God-centered. All true prayer begins with God and all true prayer ends with God. He is the Alpha and Omega of prayer. He is the beginning and the end of prayer. He is the first and the last of prayer. Prayer is not, please understand, ladies and gentlemen, prayer is not a self-centered pursuit to, to fulfill your indulgences. Prayer, hear what I'm saying, prayer is not a name it and claim it, grab, grab it and grab it, shopping spree. No. The primary focus of prayer is that you and I might be riveted upon the supreme glory of God. Everything must yield to the glory of God. That's why Paul says, therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. And looking at this doxology, looking at this prayer, it is also evident that worship is ringing through it. But in this prayer, we are ascribing to God the glory that is due His name. So this prayer then, watch this, this prayer is about rejoicing. Let it touch your team, maybe you got to rejoice. In a world filled with trials, tribulations, and temptations, it's a blessing to serve a God who is worthy of the praise, the glory, and the honor that we can give Him. It's a, it's a blessing to find something or someone to rejoice about. That's why Paul said, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Come here. The prophet Habakkuk put it like this. Though the fix tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines. The produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no fruit. The flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls. 
yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. My God, when we pray, there is reason to rejoice because we have a God who answers prayer. We have a God who sits high and looks low. We have a God who sees all and knows all. We have a God who cares about us. We can rejoice. Will you help me preach this this morning? Touch your neighbor, say neighbor, we can rejoice. I, I, I know things are hard, but we can rejoice. I know things change from one minute to the next, but we can rejoice. I know the way gets hard sometimes, but we can rejoice. Touch your neighbor, say neighbor, you can rejoice. I know the money gets funny and the change is strange, but you can rejoice. I know folk get on your last Negro nerve, but you still can rejoice. Touch your neighbor on the other side. Tell them we can rejoice. We can rejoice. We can rejoice. And this doxology suggests three important factors that must be considered in prayer. In fact, this doxology is affirming three basic things. Y'all ready for this? I'm not going to be long. Because I know y'all got the ham in the oven right now. Do I have a witness in the house? The first thing is this. That this prayer affirms God's authority. Alright, y'all go speak those what it says. Yours is the kingdom. Now, a kingdom is defined as a realm or area of activity in which a particular thing is thought to be dominant. Alright? So, in order to have a kingdom, you got to have a king. Can't have a king. Can't have a kingdom without a king. A kingdom without a king is chaos. You must have a king. Touching your titty, you got to have a king. So when we say yours is the kingdom, we are affirming God the Father as king. Y'all with me? We are affirming God's sovereign rule over all. We are affirming that God is all powerful. We are affirming that God is over and above all things. We are affirming that God is in control. Somebody let me shouting right there. And the Bible is clear that we serve a God who is all powerful and who has absolute control over all things. Come here, somebody. Yea, before the day was, I am he, says Isaiah, and there is none that can deliver out of my hand. I will work, and who shall let it? Come here, Isaiah. Isaiah 46 says, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, the things that are not yet done, say, my so shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. Yea, I have spoken it, I will also bring it to pass. I have purposed it, and I will also do it. Colossians chapter 1 says that by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth and that are under earth, whether visible or invisible, for the thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And this just affirms that God is in control. Touch him to neighbor God is in control. I know things may look like they are spiraling out of control, but God is still in control. For when it's all said and done, here's the shout. When it's all said and done, God is still on the throne and no one will ever dethrone him. So when you pray this prayer, we are acknowledging his supremacy and his sovereignty. We acknowledge that he can do what he wants to, when he wants to, the way he wants to. We are saying that the Father has the right to grant the request since he is king and reigns over all things. When we, when we are saying, it's your kingdom, we're saying you reign. Therefore, you have the right to grant these petitions because of who you are. You are our father. This is your world. And God, you are in control. When we say yours is the kingdom, we acknowledge that you as the king and are willing to 
submit to kingdom principles. Whatever the will of the king may be is all right with me because I 